Yo, Short Box Nation. Welcome back to another episode. Thanks for joining us. If you're new, welcome to the show. My name is Botter, and this is the Short Box Podcast, the comic book talk show that brings you the best conversations about comic books with the people that put their blood, sweat, and tears into making them. This mm. is episode 420, and I'm joined by my right-hand man, Cesar Cordero. Hello. Oh, nothing. No, the, no, no jazz. You said, so, what, what are you? What this is the Howard Stern show, man? What are you doing, <laughs> man? This is weird. Hot. You came at me like some sort of like, hey, I'm coming at you with my and my guy, and I'm like, <laughs> Potter, what did you? You don't normally talk like that, dude. Like, I'm gonna start. If this is Howard Stern, I'm gonna start talking like this. Robin, what what, what are you doing here? Bring in the booger eater. Mm, the booger eater. That's a. I think I think the booger eater's first appearance. And was you okay. 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 Uh, listeners, we're not here to talk about the booger eater today. We've got a guest that has been dubbed mm. the best writer in comics today mm. by a philosopher. Yeah, his name is Walter Gant. He is the short, oh, yeah, one of our hosts. Yeah, sure. He is okay. the short yeah. box OG and co-founder. I told Walt who we were having on the show today, and his hype was through the roof. So, Walt, I'm giving you your shout out at the top. I hope you're enjoying this. But um, I think uh, best writer in comics today mm. is a sentiment echoed by a lot of comic fans, a lot of people, sure. present company included. Yeah. So uh, if you're scratching your head about who that could be, well, let me toss you a lifeline, ladies and gents. We got Tom King on the podcast yeah. today. Oh. And what I say next might be a complete waste of breath considering his prolific stature in the comic industry, uh, considering his stock is red hot with all the love James Gunn has been showing him. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sorry, online. I'm just, yo. I'm yo, 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 you're good. You're selling you're it. You're selling it. You're selling it. But just in case you've been trapped in a cave for the last... 10 years or, or something, and you're like, wow, I wonder what those short box boys are up to. Let me give them a listen. Here's your too long didn't read. Tom King is an author, highly decorated comic book writer at that, and he's an ex CIA officer. Uh, so, Cesar, don't say no incriminating shit this episode. Okay? Why, why, me? why me? Because you be saying some incriminating shit sometimes, bro. Oh. You be snitching sometimes. Oh. Uh, dry snitching, as the kids would say. Uh, Tom King is best known for writing the novel A Once Crowded Sky. Uh, he also wrote The Vision for Marvel Comics, which is one of my favorite comic series ever. Uh, he also wrote The Sheriff of Babylon for Vertigo. And he, mm -hmm. and he has for sure solidified his place in comics thanks to his beloved runs on Batman, Mr. Miracle, and of course Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow for DC Comics. And come March 13th, a.k.a. the same time that you're hearing this episode, he'll have added a new entry to his long-running bibliography, with the release of Helen of Windhorn, a new gothic sword and sorcery epic that reunites him with Bill Quest Evely from Supergirl fame. Outstanding. Helen of Windhorn is being described as Conan the Barbarian meets the Wizard of Oz. And you can see for yourself because issue one is in stores right now through Dark Horse Comics. Short Box Nation, without further ado, let's welcome and give it up proper, all right? Let's give it up loud for our guest, Tom King. Hey, Tom. An ovation? Hey, Tom. Yeah. You had all those guys <laughs> off camera. Cheering. Yep, that's it. Yeah, Holy shit. a whole shit. live studio audience here. Uh, oh, well, that, was, that was very nice, kind things you said. I don't believe a fucking word of it. But <laughs> I, I, I fucking, I think of this Walt guy would have shown up if he really believed that. I think it's, it's a goddamn lie. <laughs> that's it. That's all great. I'm saying. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on the podcast. You guys are fucking great. Uh, my comics only survive because people talk about them. Nobody like goes to the store being like, "Man, I really want to read Supergirl." It's because it, your Supergirl is good. So I just appreciate what you guys all do and all the work you've done, which puts food on my kids' table. So I just want to start by hey. saying thank you. Damn. Absolutely appreciate that. That wow, we have. I think that's the first time a uh, a guest has turned the tables on us. Goddamn ungrateful fucking yo for writers. sure. Yo. <laughs> I did that. He says that. Yeah. See lavish in this. All right, this is good. Uh. Tom, I guess my first immediate question is, where will you be March 13th? Like, do you have a ritual at this point when it comes to, like, when you have a new issue one coming out? Like, do you celebrate? Or at this point, is it like, ah, eh, it's, it's work. I've got a new project. Keep it moving. <laughs> That's, dude, we're in comics. Every day is work. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's no celebration. There's no, hmm. like, like, when a movie comes out and the director's like, I'm taking two months off to be creative. That's not the medium I work in. Hmm. There's there, there's another deadline that day you have to you have to hit. So no, I'll, I'll the day this comes out, I'll be writing, and I'll be doing letter and passes, and I'll be pitching books, and I'll be working on Hollywood crap. Um, I'll probably do a signing out in Third Eye, which is like my local comic book store out in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm in DC. Yeah, I've been so there. It's a little, uh, it's I a grew up in Maryland. Store. Oh really? Uh, so don't judge me, Waldorf. Oh, I'm fucking judging you. What do you think I know where Waldorf? <laughs> yeah, no one knows where Waldorf, Maryland <laughs> no is. Idea. Southern Waldorf, Maryland. Yeah, yeah Charles Southern County. Maryland. It's like a hour outside. So 
But yeah, when I was at Fort Meade, were you a Navy uh, kid? I was gonna say, like, I feel like that's my like, dad. So. My dad was in the Navy. He was at stationed at Andrews, and um, but I was recently up there for uh, Dinfos training. So the same school that Adrian Kronhauer went to for you know to do the broadcasting stuff. You know, damn, look um, at you! Holy shit! Yeah, that's what I do in the military. So I'm a <laughs> broadcaster. So. Public affairs, broadcasting for the Air Force, and, and while I was at Fort Meade, I was like, I need to find a comic book shop. And my one of my instructors was like, Third Eye, that's where you go. So, I watched when I was overseas. Oh, oh my god, I'm sorry, I'm really old, guys. So it's been like twenty years, but I'm AFN, forty three. Yeah, it's fine. AFN Armed Forces Network is that? What yeah, it was? AFN. That's <laughs> yep, yep. Damn. That's you. Uh, yeah, dude. I watch, we. That's the only station we had that was in English. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, I watched that. <laughs> Yeah, that it's was boring. In, that was in the Afpac border region. That was there. When I was in Iraq, we had like three stations, but one of them was just, and I swear to God, this is true. It doesn't. It sounds like something out of a goddamn like mash or something. One of the channels on the TV was just like models on the runway. Like yeah. it was, it was just fashion models. I assume because they just wanted to put pretty girls on a, a station for for soldiers to look at, but they had to be clothed. Check, checks but out. But it, it was so bizarre. It was like twenty four seven. You could go back to your little pod and watch like the fashion from three years ago in Paris. Very bizarre. That's funny. Anyways, we are on a goddamn tangent. This uh, is what we yeah, do. So, this is what we do. Yeah, the the short box has also been known as the old guy hour, uh, the tangent, uh, <laughs> the tangent <laughs> yeah. show. I'm ready. So, the old guy hour. I am in. Look at this. Yeah. Beard. I'm ready. Welcome to this episode of My Knees Hurt. Thanks for dropping <laughs> by. Uh... So, Tom, <laughs> I, I understand that you're, you're based out of uh, Washington, D.C. Is that still the case? Yes, yeah, so downtown. Um, I'm about <laughs> three blocks from the Capitol. Okay. Now, this so is a, a... Go ahead. It's, it's, it's been an eventful few years down here. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, can, yeah, imagine. I can imagine. So, true story, I've actually uh, uh, got a trip to dc plan like next uh, like in a week or two and i was curious if i had to go hit up a comic shop or go do comic book things uh what would you recommend to someone visiting dc for like a weekend what are like the must hits i mean the base shop you got to hit but it's a it's a ways out it's like a 45 minute drive so if you have a rental car go to go to third eye out in annapolis it's a store unlike any store you've seen hmm. it's it's one of the biggest stores in the country it's one of the biggest stores and it's almost a nerd mall it's slowly turning into a nerd mall he mm. has one book that's like the biggest comic book shop you've ever seen. And then the store next to it is yeah, right a, next door. Yeah, is, is a game shop where, you know, all you can do your Pokemons, you can do your D&D, all that shit. And then he just put a new store in between that's just records and VHS tapes and wow. that shit. And then he has another store down the block if you just want to do – he has a whole store that's just dedicated to $1 bin diving. If you're just like a $1 bin diver, which I've been. So he has – you can do four stores it's like going to a goddamn wow. nerd mall. So awesome. uh, that's third eye. Our local comic book store here is uh, Dupont Circle called Phantom Comics, and it's very good. Hmm. It's more it's more like your indie cool kid kind of you know a downtown kind of store. But you know sometimes you want to be an indie cool kid, so I highly recommend Phantom Comics. And they're super. I nice dream there. about super being cool. an indie cool kid some nights. You know, then I wake <laughs> up and I'm me. So oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Let me go over like I thought. Tom, do you have a like? Do you have a pull list? Like, do you still pick up weekly comics uh, books? Or are you just too busy to go in a shop now? No, I don't have a. I haven't had a pull list in a long time. Uh, I get uh, free digital comics from DC, so I get all those for free. Nice. And I get. I'm also on their their trade comp list, which is the nice thing. Ooh, so I get a every nice. month. Flex. I get a. I get a big box full of trades. That's just every trade that comes out from DC. So Does it I, ever I, get like? Do you ever just get tired of all those books and have to figure out storage and where to keep them? Dude, hundred percent. No, I got. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, I bet, man. <laughs> It's too my, much of a good thing, right? My kids go to school in Maryland, and they spend a lot of time in the libraries up there, kind of their life where they go after school to hang out. Mm. And uh, and so we donate to the libraries all these sort of extra comics. So there's just some uh -huh. random like libraries uh, up in the suburbs of Maryland that have incredible DC comic book collections. That's just awesome. I have, I mean, this is my room. Uh, I have dope. an office. It's full of comics. It's it's lined mm. with bookshelves. But kind of the deal I have with myself and my wife is, is if I put something new on the bookshelf, something has to come off. Like I've mm. reached sort of maximum I like that rule. Yeah. comic book capacity. I'm familiar um, with that rule. Can you, so, can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, it looks like you've got a Green Lantern uh, in, a, in a slab, a CGC, and maybe a 9. Wonder Woman. Yeah. Can you yeah, tell I me got, about the book I've got comic books down everywhere, and I have like a lot of like art on the walls oh, wow. and shit. Um and uh, yeah, I might have been doing some Green Lantern stuff, so put a Green Lantern thing there. Oh, and I, I got on. a and I got a, a Superman there, just because I love Superman. Those are my kids back there, it's Kirby. Yeah, 
That's my, right, one, I, my one statue I ever had made, the Catwoman statue. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait. You have a son named Kirby? No, no, uh, that's my son named Charlie. <laughs> oh, Although, I was like, he, oh, was almost, cool. he was almost, he was almost, he's sitting on top of a Kirby book. Uh, he was got almost it, named Kirby. It. I couldn't talk my wife into it. But he's hmm. named Charlie after Charlie Brown. He's my only comic kid. Oh, name. oh that's cool. Yeah. Cute. All right, I, I, gotta, I gotta know then, all right? Um, you know, if you had to, house is on fire, you've already grabbed the family, the, the essential stuff, but you gotta grab one thing immediately from, from your office in your room that's comic related. What are you immediately going towards? That's man, that's tough. It's tough. I mean, I sentimental wise, mm -hmm. I have the first comic book I ever picked up off a shelf that sort of started my entire life and career, which was Avengers 300. You know, I have the exact copy <laughs> my mother bought me in whatever 1989, getting a pack of cigarettes and threw a comic book at me. And I was like, okay, I'm now dedicating my life to this thing because I love it so much. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so I should grab that, but I have some fairly expensive art that I think my wife would be pissed if I got that. If I did. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be like, yeah, I bought this. I saved this three dollar. You know, you find Avengers three hundred for about five bucks in a bin, <laughs> and, I, and I let some. I should. I let, I let some nice art stand. Um, hmm. So I guess sentimentally, I, I would grab the three hundred, but I really should grab some of the art. That's a good choice, Tom. I, I got to know how many uh, DC comic hats do you have? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm playing a mental game of seeing if in, in every video interview you have a DC-related hat. And so far, yeah, you, you've got a lot of DC hats. I was expecting the DC logo hat for this one, but you, you're treating us to the, the Soups logo today. Dude, I am not an organized man. I'm not, I am just, I am, I am a mess of a human being. I, I, I don't know where I am at any time. So I just, <laughs> I buy a lot of hats and they're scattered around my house so that when my wife turns me in the middle of dinner, is like, don't you have a podcast in five minutes? I'm like, shit! So I run upstairs... <laughs> And uh, and I grab whatever hat was on that I could reach, and so I reach for the, the Superman one. Um, so yeah, that's the reason I have a lot of hats, just because I lose I lose them all the time. So um, I got I got a, I'm not trying to get us off the hat conversation, um, but I have a question about sure, so something you said. Everyone wants to know I'm a hat kid. I know, right? The short box, the hat podcast. I said on, bad knees and uh, 15 percent <laughs> VA rating. Anyway, I have a. Uh, I've got a question about an interview you did with uh, Mitch Jarrods, Doc Shaner, and Clayman. Where Those you said, fucking guys. I can't that's, that. This is going to be good. Those fucking guys. You oh, said that God. you exist in a weird liminal space between normal people and celebrities. Um, yes. How do you navigate being somewhat of a comic celebrity now that you and your friend's body of work is starting to reach uh, the public via tentpole film projects? I mean, it's got to be, it's got to feel nice, right? No, nothing feels nice. What are you talking about? No, I'm going to, I never felt fucking nice for a second in my life. Uh, no, I don't. I I don't feel like I've reached any sort of celebrity step. If anything, I feel like when I first got into comics, we were more celebrities than we are today. Interesting. Uh, when I first got in, there was. You know, because DC, I mean, this is like everybody knows this. Warner Brothers has been cutting staff for the last three or four years. They keep getting bought and cutting staff and then getting bought and cutting staff. So when I first got there, there were, you know, there were seven assistants. There were six PR guys. You'd like go into a room and be like, I got Grayson coming out. They'd be like, sweet. We've got 15 meetings lined up for you. And we'll put you in hair and makeup. And we'll do this pot, this thing and this thing and this thing. <laughs> oh, wow. And now it's like you just show up and they're like, oh, you, you do it all yourself. You know, all, all that sort of hand holders are all gone um and that sort of idea that uh dc creates celebrities which was a little bit still there when i was when i first broke in is kind of gone no i, I don't i don't feel any more celebrated than i have ever been or or ever want to be yeah I, I do live in a weird space where if i'm at a con i can kind of cosplay as a celebrity where i'll be like walking around people want to take selfies of me um and and you know i'll, I'll sign my name a ton i I do a lot of signings. That, when I do cons, I'm all about the signings now. So I'm doing six six hour signings usually. Um, and do you that, put on that, your best funky Flashman persona. I, I I just yeah I try to connect with each person. I shake everybody's hands, much to the detriment of my own personal health. Uh, <laughs> but but I actually I mean I've had when I was a kid you know you know I've walked up to a celebrity and had a bad experience with them and said fuck them for the rest of the time even though maybe they were just having that bad day or something right. Um, so I don't want to be that one guy that's like, oh, just I, cause sometimes you're tired. Sometimes somebody's talking to you. Sometimes you just don't have the energy and it gives you, you have to kind of get up for every experience because these people, like they've been waiting in line for a long time. You got to give them, and I fucking charge for my signature. So they're already paying money for this. So hmm. I, I have to give them whatever, 
I, that, that's how I feel. Like, like th- nobody pays for just a signature. You're paying to have to ask. It. I love people asking me questions. I love having conversations yeah, right. with people. An experience. Um, yeah, an experience. So, yeah, it, that's that's kind of just my responsibility while I'm out there. I just have to do that. Uh, you know, I, I had I had kind of uh, tongue in cheek said that you know your uh, your your stock has skyrocketed since you know James Gunn mentioned you know the news of Supergirl, the Supergirl movie, the casting, and also just like publicly praising you know your work, your comic book work. And you know, I guess I was curious, like, what is your relationship with James Gunn? Like, are you guys talking comics just generally? Like, you know, do you guys you just I don't know, hang out or chat? Uh all of your James Gunn questions are going to end up the same way with me just being like, everything is great and happy. And you just get the most boring answers because <laughs> uh, that stuff has to, if, if I talk about that, we have to go through PR people. And since they're not on the phone, not yeah, since they're not enough. on the thing here, oh yeah, it's I, fine. I, I can't talk about it. So all I'm going to say is everything is wonderful and nice and happy. And thank you for asking that question, <laughs> I, which is the boring what? fucking answer. I wish I could tell you all, but no, everything. Look, but, you're, you're talking to somebody in public affairs. I understand. We yes. get it. All right, well, let me go and poke the bear some more. Hold like, on, wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> let me, let me, let me. I used ask to be in the CIA. I know how to avoid questions. That's the one thing I, I, I can do. I love it. I love it. Stay on the messaging. Hey. That's right. Uh, so let's talk about Mr. Miracle, man. I gotta say, damn, thank Mr. You. Miracle off the gate. I'm just telling. I gotta tell him thank you, man. You know, Dark Horse PR is like, um, this is not what we're. I'm doing. just gonna tell him no. thank you. All right. I want to say thank you. That's all. I'll just talk because Mr. Miracle was, was very was, special to me. It was wonderful and it was honest. And I have to know, like, while you were working on it. Was there some? Was there like a dark side esque pressure to honor like Jack Kirby's legacy, or, or maybe it was easy? Or I mean, how how, how was it to incorporate some of the more metaphysical aspects of the book? Because me, I would have felt like Scott Free trying to escape apocalypse, wrestling with the story. <laughs> you know, like I don't know what was what were your expectations? All that stuff. I'm I'm curious because that book really spoke to me. I'll just say this: I have a shrine in my house of all of Kirby's stuff. He's and it's not only and all. it's only Kirby stuff, and the only thing that's not him is you. So, oh shit! Well, I'll just that's, that's I'll just honor. say that. Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm looking at a Kirby page I got over my over my uh, hmm. wall right here that I stared every single day of my life. Yeah, man, um, blessed memory, dude. I, I I'm a huge Kirby guy. On, on some level, some of the some of the pressure was low. Some of it was high. The, the low. Let me talk about the low parts first. Number one, when Dan DiDio, who was the head of DC, with he's like, Mr. Miracle has never worked. We've never managed to make it work at any of the time. So on on that level, I was you know sort of taking a swing at. Uh, so, so I was I was least, you know going down a path other people had failed. I don't know how to. When you're on Batman, you're always thinking, man, Frank Miller's always going to be better than me at this. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on Mr. Miracle, you have a shot at doing it well. Hmm. Um, so that was low, and then there was also the low pressure that I had Mitch, and and when when you're with Mitch, who's just like my favorite artist in comics. Um, and, and one of my best friends, uh, uh, you feel like you're just, you know, you're swinging with a net beneath you. He, he's going to take whatever you get him and make it more beautiful and make it more and, and make it transcend it. So like those two things were low pressure. The high pressure parts were twofold. Number one, the, the Kirby thing you mentioned, cause I really wanted to do something that was Kirby, but from the beginning, we're like, we well, can't out Kirby Kirby. You can't go bigger than him. You can't be more cosmic than him. Kirby was the greatest thinker who's ever been in this medium. His imagination is stretched to other realms and mm-hmm. galaxies. Um, and so we had to kind of take all of that Kirbyness and then internalize it as a metaphor, yep. uh, which, which I, I thought I could do, but I, I, I don't know. I was arrogant at the time. The, the other thing was, I had just had this big hit with Vision, um, which was a surprise hit. I, I didn't think it would go over, and, and, it, and it went over. And it was very much p- people being like, okay, that was your first album. You know, uh, what's your next one? You know, <laughs> it's like, right, like that right. One, it was very much like, do that, that was the assignment from the beginning. It's like, Tom, you did Vision over Marvel, do it over at DC. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this again and and sort of hit that. You know, it's it's a tough row where you're hitting something that's both popular and artistic at the same time right the sophomore um, slump is always yeah. looming over you like a specter like jesus dude, dude what do you want <laughs> man yes yeah, that second movie that second album it's all that stuff right. uh can i say but, that i i feel like you did a pretty good job uh doing the well okay so l- let's talk kirby here like he yes he had the cosmic thing on lock but the man was layered and definitely had no problem uh venerating the the spirituality of comics too you know like for sure there was a level there was a spiritual I, to me that's a very spiritual book you're 
your run on it, man. Like that's a very spiritual book to me. I got a I got a daughter, I got a wife, and all that stuff resonated with me hard. Like a lot of that stuff. Um and just the way Dark Side is kept coming up, you know, obviously Grant Morrison reference, but you know, you you had it became something else too. Like you took it and you made it yours. And then it be, it meant something else to me. Like, man, like the grind, the hustle, like everything that made like every, anytime you felt some sort of authoritarian type presence, dark side is, and not just like in a literal sense in your life, you know, like, mm. and what does that mean to somebody who's just trying to be a good person, a good dad, a good friend, you know, a good, a good hero to maybe people that don't see it, you know, it, it, I'm not, you know, man, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass, obviously, but like, it's, it's good shit. And I, I feel like if I didn't get that out there, out the gate, you were like, B, but you were like, you were like, yo, see, you're going to talk about Mr. Milk out the gate. I was like, man, I gotta, <laughs> no, I gotta I let my no that. man, let my man know where I stand, you know, so that way we can sh- set this shit off. Right. So. No, it's, it's, it's cool. I mean, it was, I mean, you gotta go back in time for that book. It was 2016. Yeah. Um, I've talked about this a lot, but I I had one of those sort of, um, first season of Sopranos moments, right? When those panic attacks where yeah. you kind of think you think you're going to die and you go to the hospital and you ask the, the doctor, am I, am I dying or am I crazy? And they're like, you're crazy. And you're like, thank God. Oh wait, well, I'm crazy. And then 2016 hit and it was just, I mean, that year was, we had no idea it was coming. We had, we didn't know that was like the entrance to the cave. We just thought it was just a little bit of darkness and there was light coming. We didn't know we'd be in here for a while. Um, but so we were just like entering sort of a, ca- a cave of like what's going to happen. And everyone was saying, well, it's going to be a shitty ass time, but it's going to be great art. And I remember thinking, I'm here. I have a character I love. I have an artist I love. All those people were saying we got to make great art. I got I'm the fucking guy. I have to do that. Like, <laughs> um, that was uh, your dark side is. <laughs> yeah. And dark side is started with, with um, a buddy of mine, Julian Lytle, who's a, who's a Kirby fanatic. I called him and I was I was like the offer is Mr. Miracle. He's like, oh, you get to do Dark Side. I was like, Dark Side. He's kind of like a Diet Coke Thanos. I mean, I know he came first, but come hmm. on, Thanos is because I mean, this is the time that you know all the movies are coming out, right? And he's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Dark Side's bigger than Thanos. I was like, he's. he's I was like, why? He's like, because Dark Side is. I was like, what does that mean? Dark Side is. And Julian's like, you ever have two paths and you know the right way to go, but you still take the wrong one. Dark side is man. Hmm. You ever just look around? You don't understand what's going on. You don't understand why everything is going horrible. Dark side is as Julian was saying this to me, and as he was saying it, I was seeing just those flashes of black with that writing. Dark side is, mm. and I was like, oh shit, Damn. yeah, that's what the book is. Yeah, so it comes from a guy named Julian who who um who, who's still one of my best friends. He's over my house the other day. So, uh, Damn. yeah, uh, and then and then that that became a book, and it, it was really you know uh, Mitch took a hold of it, and you have to remember at that same time I was working on Batman. And that was sort of the high pressure gig. So, on, on, in some ways, Mister Miracle was a little bit of a low pressure compared to Batman. Huh. It's funny how that is. How much? Yeah. Uh, I guess how much say do do you have? I imagine at this point you got a lot of say. But you know, thinking of like Mister Miracle and you know your early DC stuff. But how much say did you have in the characters that that you uh, that you wrote? Like, what was it? Did you come up with the plot first, or was it you know the assignment, the character first? I, I guess like what was your process in picking some of these? You know, respectfully, you know, B, C list characters. That was something me and C was saying was like, you have this uncanny ability to take someone like the human target or the Omega Men and just elevate them to this status where it almost, you know, it just becomes a classic. Like, I guess what comes first? Is it the character or the plot? Yeah, man. I, this is another instance where it's like we see you take these characters that maybe some people sleep on. And then you instantly elevate mm. them to some sort of transcendent level. And then people are like, what the fuck? Because I'll tell you this much. I have never said the word human target more times than I did last year. <laughs> All right? It's ungodly how many times I said human target. Well, the human targets had as many TV shows as The Flash. They're equal in, in TV shows. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's a good point. It's true. Um, I, I, I am of the firm belief uh, that any character can be awesome. Maybe not like Brother Power the Geek, but who knows? But uh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> uh, who's really the, like, the, the one listener that is a huge Brother Power fan just dropped that. He was like, "Oh, he's like, no, fuck that guy, man. I'm out of here. Yeah, un- I love that zombie hippie. That zombie hippie is yeah. my favorite one. Him and Prez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but dude, I, I did Lady Cop. I, I, I go really, really low. Hmm. Um, that's funny. Yeah, I, I've always, but I've always asked editors. I was like, no, give me 
a character. I do, I do, but I, you know, a vision was given to me. Mr. Miracle was given me. Human Target was very much given to me. Uh, Supergirl, in some ways, was given to me. Uh, I, I, I like being put in a box. I, I like, I've, I do very few things well. I'm terrible at running and putting basketballs in hoop. Um, Lord knows, I'm raising my children wrong. But I, I, I if someone gives me. A, a, a character i can see sort of what's essential in that thing and and and, and see how to bring it out and, and basically it's just by treating it seriously by by just being like oh giving you sort of the best version of that i mean i was writing archie the other day yeah for some reason and uh and so i went back and read all these old archies and treated him the same way i would mr miracle like what makes this guy cool what makes him funny go back to the basics that damn reggie do, do you have reggie. like a eights reggie god Damn, Reggie. Do you have like a morning routine that you stick to, or, or a particular process when it when it comes to writing? Like, do you ever have time to just write for fun, or or just do other non writing comic book things for fun? Non writing, I do have a routine. Um, it always falls apart because I have three children and a dog. Hmm. Uh, but generally speaking, I write I write Monday through Friday. I don't write on the weekends. I want to hmm. spend time with my kids and all that crap. Uh, but by st- I start on Monday, finish on Friday. I turn in a script almost every single Friday. It's gotten a little weird after with the Hollywood stuff because of working mm-hmm. on that now. Uh, but I, I, I start the script on Monday, finish it Thursday night. No matter how late I have to go, it gets finished Thursday. And then I edit it on Friday, turn it in Friday night. That's that's the way I'm every single week. So what that means is if like today is a Monday, today I didn't write shit. So I sucked. Um, <laughs> but uh, because I was in what they call what they call let, lettering drafts, you know, they say that you know they send you the letters, and I had did like six of them today, so I didn't have time to write. So that means I have a lot more to write in the three days I have to write the script. I have to write to read, which is which is Penguin. So yeah, that's and that's that's sort of my routine. If I get fucking four days to write a script, it's the best week ever. But this week it's three. Okay, let me Got let you. me ask you a question here. So we were talking about characters. So yeah. uh, from a writer's perspective, do you? Does the voice of the character ever get in the way of where you want to take them? Like, is there a situation where you're like, but no, I planned this out. But the way, because of the way the character is there, it's just like, no, they wouldn't do that. You know, like, ah, shit. Now I got to turn this around. Dude, all the time. Every single hmm. day of my goddamn hmm. life. Yeah. That happens. <laughs> yeah. I'll can, have can like you, yeah. a huge, I'll have a plan and I'll be like, all right, he's going to do this and do this. And the character's just like, no, I'm not fucking doing that. That's 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 not happening. What's the last like, time that that happened? What's the last time that like that happened? Should happen with fucking Archie. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. That's that. I totally. I a thousand percent believe that. That damn Archie. Uh, it's like Jughead's going on a diet. Nah, son. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm eating a burger, bitch. No, I'm not. Two of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, literally last week I was like, okay, Betty and Veronica are you know Archie's doing this thing, and Betty and Veronica are gonna like kind of just fall fall into it. And I started writing them, and they were immediately pissed at Archie. And I was like, God damn, but you were supposed to follow it. I only have two pages, and you got to be here in two pages. They're like, no, we're pissed at Archie. You got to deal with that first. That's and I was cool. like, all right, I guess I guess we're doing that. Um, so, yeah, that, that happens absolutely. That happens absolutely constantly. Um, I'm trying to think of like a, a moment. Do you have other friends that, you know, obviously that earn the business that write with you? Do they ever commiserate with you about the same sort of thing where it's like, God damn it, I had this great idea, and it's like, I don't. I didn't know until as soon as I tried to execute it that it completely contradicted what the characters were were about. Yeah, I mean, Josh Williams and I have a standing call. We talk comics once a week for about an hour, um, <laughs> and we kind of just be creative and and also gossipy about all the shit and um, and line things up. So yeah, we we kind of have one sort of creative call. And I I, you know, I bounce my, my kids are the best people to bounce shit off of because they actually seem to care about everything. So I'll be like, does this work? Does that work? Um, but mostly, but and then I have I have a, I have an ongoing conversation with those two those three fuckers you said Doc Shaner, uh, Mitch and Clay, where we've been talking. We have a, a text thread that goes twenty four hours a day. It's been going on for like six years. Oh wow! Um, so I, I also go on there and kind of you know look what I just made them do. Look what this person just said. Is there a name for the thread? Come on. Uh yeah, it's called Three Men and a Baby. Yeah, because I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know who we don't know which one's the baby. So it's yeah. great. Tom and the Scott Freeze. Yeah, no, no, that, don't fucking say that. <laughs> I, it's a bunch of artists and a shit and a writer. So I, I'm, I'm on the, I'm always right, being like, I'm, it's, it's me constantly apologizing, being like, I'm so sorry, I'm so because they're like, I just worked twelve hour, I just worked you know twenty four hour days for eight days in a row on this goddamn splash page, and I was like, 
Splash page. Um, superheroes. All right. <laughs> Next. You're like, you're like, draw this for me. Draw I'm sorry me. ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess on, on the topic of, of, of your process and um, you know your your colleagues, and to bring it back to uh, Helena Winhorn, was it easier working with with Evely or, or Clayton on, on this project since you know you guys worked on Supergirl together, or was this like so different that it might as well have been work might as well have been working from scratch again? No, it was very much the same. In fact, it's such the same because I wrote this right during. COVID, I got a little crazy. I don't know if this happened to some people, but I got crazy productive. Um, so I was writing like a fiend during COVID. So I got so far ahead that I could write my books like one after another. So I would just be like, I'm writing all of Human Target the next four months or Human Target months. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm writing all of Rorschach. I'm writing all of Danger Street, all of Supergirl. And I sort of wrote them all in a row that way. And I wrote Helen of Windhorn right after Supergirl. So it's been whatever, two and a half years since I wrote it. And so I was, I was in that rhythm of writing um, for Bilkis. And I mean, Clayton and I work on every single project together. So we kind of have a, you know, we know how each other think. Uh, so no, it, it wasn't for, I mean, this is the, it's literally the writer, the penciler, inker, the colorist, and the letterer from Supergirl. The only thing has changed is the editor. Hmm. Uh, and, and, he's, and he's a very nice editor. So yeah, everything's, every, it was very much a continuation of Supergirl. It's also very Dude. similar. I didn't want to go. Sometimes you want to do, you know, like Mitch and I did Sheriff of Babylon, which was like a very military grounded thing. And then we right. were like, didn't want to get <laughs> shut up in that box. So then we did Mr. Miracle, which was like cosmic and weird. And then we didn't want to get shut in that box. So then we did Adam Strange, which was like kind of the anti-hero. Uh, this was not that. I was like, I want to do more of Supergirl. I like that. I think people mm. loved it. I just want to do more of that thing in a similar genre with a similar storytelling technique. And there's, you know, there's, you know, literary aspirations to all of it, but mostly I just want to be like, if you love Supergirl, here's more of that. And that's, that was, that was the goal from the very beginning. Can I say, I really thought that what we saw, well, I guess what I've seen, what I, I guess I've been exposed to regarding Helena Windhorn, it gives me uh John Carter of Mars vibes a little bit. Yeah, like, very much so. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. Do you dig any of that stuff? Is that stuff influenced you at all? I mean, do you like the pulps, that sort of thing? Love the pulps, yeah. I mean, uh, if you look at the Strange, uh, Strange Adventures, there's a lot of John Carter from Mars there. For sure, um, yeah. I, and, you know, I, I never assume. I mean, I'm, I'm again... I'm older and I enjoy every, I get made fun of on the show lots of times from like, you know, it's cool that uh, Doc Savage is a real smooth cat. He's a he's a sharp cookie. That guy. I've been reading the shadow and all that I, stuff, you know, like I wish that was a joke, man. I really <laughs> wish that was a joke. <laughs> I, well, I mean, but it but it influences so many things and it, and it's still good, you know, like good art's good art. Like, I think it's one thing in America that we kind of have a, a sort of a like a little little shelf life on our art as opposed to like that's why you can go to Europe and still headbang to the scorpions mm. <laughs> you know and like people are still like yeah this is cool you know like here it's like eh, that's old but I feel a lot of that classic stuff is kind of making its way back and I really really liked seeing uh the space opera elements in Supergirl like beautiful uh the story and kind of rooted in sort of a west sort of like a western you know and I like that you know, this new, it's like, a, it's like, all right, you like that? Well, we're, it's kind of the same, but we're flipping it up on you because now we've got sort of like the Edgar Rice Burroughs influence coming at you, you know, where it's like, here we go, you know, another, another adventure, but you're, you're in for a wild ride because it's not what was, what was going on before. Yeah. I mean, look, Dune, Dune 2 or whatever you want to call it, it's coming out next week. It's going to be the biggest movie in America. It's getting like the best reviews since Star Wars. Yeah. That's what I hear. And, See you on Thursday. I can't wait to, I'm so, I'm hyped. But, uh, I mean, Dune comes directly out of John Carter from Mars. You can draw a one-to-one -one hmm. line. So I don't, don't think of yourself as old. You're in the zeitgeist. I mean, that just, I mean, that, Dune is just wow. a, it's like, a, in the it's just I've a never 60s thought I'd drug that retelling of John Carter from Mars, you know, it's no a sort of colonial narrative of, you know, a white guy goes to a brown land and becomes a king. That's exactly what Dune is. Sure. Um, but, but with drugs. So, so, so yeah, no, nothing, everything old is new again. Right. Um, and I and 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 I think you know knowing where that stuff comes from. Some of that stuff has some just absolutely gorgeous art. I mean, um, so. Well, I mean, it, it, speaking of, I mean, Bilquis is no slouch. For God's sakes, like 
And I wanted to ask if I could jump in, like what of her work based on, you know, your interpretation and what you've gotten to see, like what of her work on this particular title, I guess, speaks to the description of it being um, Conan the Barbarian meets Wizard of Oz. Was it like a is there like a specific page or, or cover or moment that you could speak of without spoiling the story, obviously? Dude, I, this is going to be the most and then people are going to be talking about the art. I, I was on a book called Human Target, and it was a very weird book to market. Um, to talk about because normally I go out and I pitch a book, you know, I work with slackers like Clay and Mitch and I'm like, this is why <laughs> I was like, you got to buy Mr. Miracle because it talks to our time or you got to, hmm. uh, uh, get on Batman because he's about to get, you know, it's like you're using like little hooks for, for human target. All I said was like, just come for the art, just come for Greg Smallwood. You don't have to, hmm. fuck, you don't want to read my words. That's fine. I guarantee this is a game changer art book. And that's what human target was just from day yeah. one. As soon hmm. as I was seeing it, I was like, oh my God, this guy's just like. He's like, oh, where's the bar? Fuck that. I'm going right over it. And th that, that's what that's, I could sell this book the same way. Bilkis's art on this is next level. Hmm. Um, she sent me a mood board at the very beginning, and it was full of kind of this book. It was full of two things, kind of these high fantasy ideas and, and a very sort of a 1930s, like old movie vibe. Love it. Uh, which, which I dug. So I, I sort of combined those in, into this thing. Yeah. So she, she's also changing her style. It, for people, don't, the, the book is about. Um, uh, where to start with it it's 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 about a, a, a girl do you guys know about conan so ah. it's about a, a girl whose father's a pulp writer like we were talking about before she's 16 mm. years old she's a pulp writer um of stories like conan and like if you guys don't know the author of the conan stories robert e howard robert e howard uh famously when he like was only 30 years old after he literally invented a new genre that we're still writing to this day right uh, uh, his mother died. He, they were very close. He walked to his car, took a gun out of his glove compartment, and shot himself in the head. Yeah. And 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 nobody and nobody knows really why. It's not really sort of understand it. And that's sort of where I, I started from there. So this is about a, a sixteen year old girl, and she, her father is a Conan story, and she he kills her, himself, and she's left alone. Her grandfather comes and gets her and brings her to his home, which is like this big like sort of castleish place. I think sort of Beauty and the Beast, the big Gothic house. And what she slowly learns is that her grandfather is the Conan character hmm. and that her father was writing about her grandfather. And the, and, wow. and the, the, the story is about this grandfather and this granddaughter bonding together over the fact that the generation between them killed themselves and them trying to sort of understand why that happened. And in the middle of trying to understand that and try to understand each other, they're living between these two worlds, one sort of the grounded world of the 30s and one a Conan the Barbarian magical mystery world. Hmm. And so Bilkis has to do all that stuff. She has to do the the emotions of a girl losing her father. She has to do a uh, huge fantasy, you know, blow your mind worlds you've never seen before, like we did in Supergirl with the planets. But now we're in a different genre. We're in sword right. and sorcery. And, uh, and she has to do the gothic big castle with all the swords and all the intricacies. So all of those things, all in her style, it's, I mean, it's to die over. She's been drawing it for two and a half years. She's put more lines in this than anyone has a right to see. Wow. Uh, I, I, I've, you'll be blown away by how it looks. It's incredible. Oh, and we, we had a and chance to read. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. We had a chance to read the first uh, issue. I, I finished it uh, last night, and I yeah. think your, your hook is, is on point. It's one of those first issues where you're like, all right, I'm in for the ride. I, I came in. I, I, I went into the ride because it's Tom King and, and Bill Quez and, and all that. And yeah, I'm here for the rest of the ride. Yeah, you, um, you, her style is distinctively different and not uh, like it's, it's noticeable. You're like, oh man, like all the stops have been pulled out. Like the, the, you, I'm assuming in the mood board, like there was a color palette too, because that, yes. that, it's changed completely. It's so, yeah. so good. And everything you said captures it. Like it's the idea of, like I, 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 all this pulp stuff. Like you're saying, like you, you, you guys know who wrote Conan. Like, I'm telling you, man. I, I'm a huge Robert E. Howard fan. I'm telling dude. you, like, man. I'm old as hell. I, I was I got first edition. Yeah, and I mean seriously, like all all the stories, man. Freaking um, Phoenix on the Sword. I mean everything. Like all the uh, all the Saltoon well, of the Undead, man. Odd well, stuff for, is where I live. Yeah. For people who don't know Conan, maybe you know Game of Thrones. The Dorthraki, that's Conan. That's all it is. Yeah. Right. George R. R. Martin took the Dorthraki as like, what if we we combine Conan with high fantasy mm. and sort of that that idea of like the Jason Momoa character that you saw in the Game of Thrones? That's who Conan is. He's like the right. toughest, biggest fucking barbarian who kicks ass. Um, now, obviously, um, you know when, when it comes to art, 
people are going to interpret it different ways when, when they read the book and, and make their own meanings. But is there anything in particular that you hope people maybe pick up on, whether it's like a messaging or a theme or maybe like a specific thing you had in mind when you wrote the story? I mean, the way art works or the way it's supposed to work, like when I was a, when I was in college, I was a philosophy major because I don't know, I didn't want a job afterwards or some shit. <laughs> that is so yay! Yeah, I just want to piss off my parents. I don't know what it was, but I was a philosophy. And major. And you really love school debt, so you know. Yeah, I love out. school. That's the whole thing. So uh, Joseph I, 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 Campbell. I didn't understand why I, you philosophy majors are the most arrogant fucking people. So, and one of the arrogant thoughts I had is like, why do people even write literature? If you wanted to tell me something, just fucking tell me. Do it in a philosophy book. If you want to tell me. You know, if you're pride and prejudice and you want to tell me there's, you know, like um, judging people is not always good, you know, till you get to know them. I was like, just write that as a sentence. Why do I got to read a fucking book to, to discover it? Um, with the wisdom that came with with age is the fact that, like, there are things in our language that we can't get at. Um, there are things you cannot express just by writing sentences, by writing essays, by explaining it. You can only get at those things through story. Like our language just limited. It just, it just, it's a wall between us and the real world, a wall between our emotions, a wall between you and me. And the way you get through that wall is through stories, which is why, you know, our fucking Bible is based on, you know, little vignettes. Um, because you're trying to communicate with someone in a way where you can't talk to them directly. You can't say, this is the moral of the story. Let me tell you a story so you can connect with part of me, connect with part of you. And where we come together, that's where the magic happens. And that's where art is fucking form. So I'm never like, oh my God, I want, I really want you to know the secret of this story. And if you figure this secret out, you'll know what it's about. I, I'm trying to get at something that I can't get at myself hmm. through this story. And I want you to bring yourself to the story. And in the middle, we'll meet and have some, we'll, we'll have actual chemistry and we'll have actual, you know, literary experience. So that's what it's about for me. Wow. That's so, so then in that same regard, like what does your ideal story have to have? Like what elements make it good for you? Uh, you know, when I first started writing, I was like, my stories, people read them on the toilet, and it only takes one shit to read them. <laughs> the amount and of that, sound bites that you're giving me are it's, yeah, it's beautiful. And and that's got to be a I'm, drop. That's now I'm like drop. matured, and I've learned some things, and I'm like, I want to write a two shit story. That's what Ooh. I want to do. I want to write a comic book. You got to fold the page and be like, I'm coming back on my next shit and finishing this because, you're like, boy, you know, what? I'm gonna go eat it. that gas station burrito, and I'm gonna come back. And that's finish. what I'm saying. <laughs> I want to. I'm, I'm gonna write a two shit story. That's my ambition. You really are a philosophy major. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That is so good. <laughs> you got to aim for the clouds, man. You got to aim for I both shits. I see it. You know, like, don't just aim for the bottom. Two oh, <laughs> when my daughter comes to me for advice, I'll be like, you will listen to what Tom King said. My friend Tom you. King said one time, oh. you shoot for two shits, honey. And she'll say, get away from me. I'm talking to mom. I want that comic where your wife or your husband is yelling at you and be like, dinner is ready. Are you still on the toilet? Tom King wrote a comic book. See, that's, that's success in life. It's like, look, my leg is asleep. I'm not getting up. <laughs> so, look, Tom, I'm going to give you maybe the biggest compliment you've ever gotten. Human Target was a three shitter for me. Right? Whoa! Oh, a three yeah. shitter! Oh my three god! Shitter, baby. Come on, Dude, that broke through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> oh oh man! Oh, I'm just laughing because I'm putting I'm that just, on the cover. <laughs> Human Target laughing. has destroyed bathrooms throughout Hold America. On. I'm laughing because on your side of the podcast, everybody's hearing that shit. <laughs> god, that's funny. It's like oh, three shits. You know, they don't hear what we're saying. All right, toilet talk aside. Um, you have brought up uh, Clayton Cowles uh, a few times, uh, who is the letterer for uh, Helena Winhorn, also the, the letterer for a, a few of your titles. Um, I every, mean, you've even said, every title. Every single title. Say it the same. Yeah. Well, last week's episode was all about the role of a comic letterer. I was fortunate enough to interview uh, Hassan Atzman Elhow. And, you know, he kind of j- just really gave a great perspective on the kind of hidden art of lettering. And I, w- I was curious if you could speak kindly about Clayton and maybe talk about you know, how he contributes to the book, uh, you know, outside of just providing letters to the the script and and to the comic. No, a letter is a a storyteller. He's um, a partner in everything, or she is a partner in everything you do. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, Clayton and I are are, are just, we're connected at the hip. I first use, I mean, I've been with a few, I've been with a few letters, (laughs) sounds very bizarre. Um, Clayton first, and I first worked together on Vision, and I just remember getting the 
getting the Kongs in. And, and what I love about Clayton, there are letters who can do sort of more, you know, like um, no, no one does fonts like John Workman, right? Like I worked with him before. It's crazy. He still draws them on the thing. And, and nobody does balloons like Todd Klein. Uh, and nobody does expressiveness like Ahasan. But what, what I love about Clayton is his placement, where he puts the balloons and where he puts the captions. He always mm. knows like just the right, because you can put it just up, up in the panel or in the middle of the panel, you know, because you know, I always do splash pages with just a little bit of dialogue. It's constantly doing that. And he knows exactly where to put that caption, exactly where, so it really hits the reader. And that's what I love about him is, his, is, is just his theory of placement. I'm also a guy who believes um, uh, that it's my job as a writer and I don't always conform to this and, but to get out of the way of the reader, like when you're reading my books, I don't want you thinking about who's making them. <laughs> I want you thinking about the story. If you're reading hell of Windhorn, I want you to be thinking about Helen, not about the fact that I wrote the most beautiful fucking purpley sentence. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I want you to, to get, you know, you like what do comics do? The best thing they do is people work hard all fucking day and they listen to the news and it's shitty and you get home and you sit on your couch and you read a comic and you get to disappear. Um, and that's what's wrong. So, so Clayton doesn't do his lettering disappears. It's subtle in a way that just draws you in and you're not like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. You just kind of fall into the comic book and you're not thinking about the lettering because that's how good the lettering is. Hmm. Wow. So, okay. I'm going to, I'm, this is not, I promise you not a political question. Um, it's going to get nerdy real Holy fast. Holy shit. So the words, I mean, I'm, I'm sure like everybody's like, you know, after 9-11, everything changed, quote unquote, right? <laughs> yeah, Every, heard you, you, you've heard that before. I've heard it before. And that gets thrown around a lot. But as far as Batman is concerned, um, in my opinion, it seemed a little true because a lot of his rose gallery started having more, uh, I guess, terrorist informed uh, modus operandi. Um, and I remember your run on Batman sticking out to me because it sort of reflected a transition like a transition sort of back to his heroism defined by his detective skills. Um, was any of that consciously done? Like, the, you know, we just got done talking about how you don't want to be seen and you, you know, you could write the most purpliest sentence in the world. Um, is that something you, you were conscious or you were aware of? I mean, you kind of, you, you didn't change the game, but like, I remember distinctly reading like, Oh, so this is refreshing. <laughs> like, not every bad guy in Batman's Rogues Gallery has to act like, oh, I'm going to take Gotham captive You're doing this and unless something happens, you know? Like, it was like, oh, we're back to detective stories. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that was just finding, and, and, I, and there, there's some flaws along the way that I did wrong, but it, a lot of it was just looking at what Scott had done so brilliantly and being like, I can't do that because he just did it. <laughs> and he did it well. I didn't want. I mean, that's that's why like Joker wasn't a big thing, and right. S Scott Scott loves the the plot of like, um, which which was also prominently featured in the Batman movie, um, which I think took a lot from Scott. Uh, the 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 plot of like we're gonna test the city and is it evil or is it good, and and sort of we take the whole city hostage and sort of test that. Uh, and so so I kind of threw out that plot and said I'm not gonna use it. That's Scott's plot. Um, and I went in with the, sort of this romance idea where I was going to do Batman and Catwoman and this sort of Bane idea, and I tried to ground it. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think the 9-11 the, the stuff, I think that was just the time. It was kind of 9-11 that sort of, and dude, no one's, I mean, lots of people's lives were changed in 9-11, but, but Lord knows mine was too. The fact that I sort of went from going to law school to going into the CIA. Hmm. Uh, uh, but I think by the time I got in Batman, we're talking 2016, we were kind of just kind of ready to let go of those fears and face new fears at that time. So I, I think I was just kind of, you know, you, you, you think you're independent, but sometimes you're just a leaf on the wind of history kind of thing. Hmm. What's harder being an intern for Chris Claremont or a CIA <laughs> agent or, or, or the man who's going to help save the cinematic DC universe as a quote, integral part of James Gunn DCU. Uh, uh, you know, it was the hardest job I, so I went from uh, Chris Chris Claremont. I did that, and then I, I I was in the CIA almost right out of college. I worked for the Justice Department for a little bit in between, and then I was a full time dad, a stay at home dad, for two to three years, depending on how you count it. With first one kid, and then God fucking my daughter came right after. So two kids, <laughs> wow. and they were babies, 
And I worked that until I had enough money that we could afford daycare hmm. uh, in the comic industry. And and then I was a full-time comic book writer writing 24 hours a day. And let me tell you, the fucking stop in between the stay-at-home dad, that was the hardest job. Hmm. That was the one that I just, in terms of being exhausted at the end of the day, in, in terms of like, you don't even know if you did a good job or not. You feel <laughs> gu- guilty. You know, taking care of, I, I miss it so much. And I'm so glad I had those years with my little guys. Um, oh. Sure. But, but it's such a unique combination of, of of adrenaline and fright, and also incredible amounts of boredom. Hmm. Uh, to to read, you know, the same Curious George book for the fifty seventh time, and you're like, I want to be a comic book writer so bad. Or yeah. <laughs> to, you either have that on half your head, or the other half of your head is like, I could be in a war zone shooting people. What am I doing? Um. So you, wow. like, yeah, that was that was yeah. not shooting people. That sounds wrong, but uh. I could be, you know, c- hmm. contributing to America's security, and instead I'm here being like, "Oh, and then Peppa Mama the Llama Red up. Pajama." Yeah, mama. Um, <laughs> so, so that 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 was much sure. The Chris Claremont being his intern was not a hard gig. My entire job was just to sit there and say yes, Chris. Um, so really, like, I could have gotten like, um, you know, like one of those little ducks that bops up and down. You know, he, 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 <laughs> nice. I would just go if you've ever talked to Chris. This is not a known thing. You just say hello, and then he goes on a monologue. And I, oh yeah, you, you're at a con, so that maybe sounds you get a, right. You maybe you get a 45 minute monologue. I, there was no con around us, so there was a five hour monologue. So I would hmm. just sit in his office, and Chris would go on. And I've worshipped him as a writer, and to this day, I still do. I think he's one of the game changers in our business. Uh, and so I would just kind of sit there while he told me everything that was wrong in the comic industry for five hours, and then I would come back on Tuesday, <laughs> and he'd start over again. That was <laughs> that, that sounds that, about right. That was the gig. What I was match. 19. It was wonderful. Well, what are some, I guess, like, if you could drill down to, like, one big lesson or piece of advice that he gave you that you still carry to this day, like, is there one that comes to mind that you're happy that you got from him or learned from him? I mean, the lesson he'd say, and probably the lesson I should say, is he's like, every comic is everyone is someone's first comic. He's that, That's his, like, calling card. But actually, it's not what I fucking learned, because I don't follow that as much as I should. Um <laughs> I remember the, I'm, I love Star Trek. I'm a nerd, uh, and he was talking about Star Trek and writing Star Trek. And he's like, "You know why Star Trek is is perfect?" I was like, "No." And then talking about the original series, he's like, "Because when you write Star Trek, you've got Kirk, you've got Spock, and you've got McCoy, and so Kirk's brain is outside of his body." I was like, "What the fuck does that mean?" That means when you're writing him, if Kirk has to make a decision whether to go this way or that way, his logical side is Spock, and his emotional side is McCoy, and so you're not writing three characters; you're just writing Kirk. And I had hmm. never thought of writing that way, of being like, wait, so the, the supporting characters are just there to support the hero? Like, I, I'd never, I'd always thought of them as like, Spock is Spock, McCoy is McCoy. And I don't know, that, that fucking blew my mind as a writer, hmm. as, as a little baby writer. The idea that, that the, the other characters are there to sort of serve Kirk. I don't know. Yeah. So that, that, that was the thing that no, most I, knocked me over to this day. That's, that's funny, because I've said the same thing about Harry Potter, Hermione, and Ron, or Luke. Han and Leia, yes. like it's the pathos logos eros connection yeah. like all that stuff is like yeah it's one brain and that they all have a conversation with each other you know i that's freaking fantastic man can, also can i interject real quick i know you wanted to ask something god bless it how how do you keep making the right decisions thank you for putting batman mask of the phantasm in like everything thank you for that <laughs> also that's Clay Man. Clay loved Phantasm and wanted to. Okay, draw. I, now when we're I, down to the mystery here. Okay. When, when I first approached Clay with that project, because I was getting, well, it was a compromise. They said they'd give me sort of this Batman book and I could pick any artist I wanted for it. Hmm. And I picked Clay because I just think, I don't know, Clay's like a modern day Jim Lee. He doesn't draw. I wish he'd draw more so you could see, but sometimes I look at his pages and they're just little miracles because he's pen and ink. He draw and he draws from memory. He doesn't draw. He's, it's, he, he, he's a, he's a, Clay is, is a genuine genius of the medium. Wow. Um, and and so he said, I'll if you know Clay, he's like very low key. He didn't say a lot of words. He's, um, and he's like, I'll do it if we do Phantasm. So I, I went to DC. I was like, I don't care how we do it. Can we just do Phantasm? Clay said he'll do it. And uh, and yeah, that's that's how Phantasm came in the book. It's cool. Do you have a white buffalo in terms of uh, someone that you want to work with, whether it be an artist, or another writer, or, or just a creative individual? It doesn't even have to be in comics, but is there someone that if you had the opportunity to to work with before you died and, and make it happen? Who would that be? Man, that is... Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, my mind immediately goes to comic book artists I just love to do anything with, you know, that would really blow my mind. I don't know. There's like, there's like the little kid in you that's like, man, Bill Sienkiewicz would you know, be fun. There you go. Like, you know, like to, to hit the dream. I did a story with Walt Simonson, my sort of hero as a kid who wrote Avengers 300 we were talking about earlier. And that was just, cool. I mean, that absolutely blew my goddamn mind. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, like or like artists i mean i've chris somney i mean i've been chasing that guy only does for himself now gabe gabriel hardman i love his sort of noir f- phase he's in now again only draws for himself these bastards who are writing for themselves i hate him um yeah some some, some of those guys I, when i first came into comics there's this thing called twart which was art plus twitter that's how long ago this was and it was a bunch of young guys um, and I, I, I followed them like I was their fucking stalkers. I just thought they were the best artists in comics and they were all in their early twenties and they've all gone on to become huge sort of legends. And, and Mitch was there and doc was there. Um, Brett Schoonover was there and as uh, Somni and, and Hart. So I, I always say I'm going to try to work with all of them eventually at the end of my mm-hmm. career. I push with most of them. You know, speaking about yeah, hearing you mention these artists and you know, I'm thinking about like the different publishers and just you just like your different projects and where you've been at you know uh, marvel you've been at dc you've been at vertigo um i i want to say image i, I want to say image I've done but... image i've done image okay. boom and dark horse now i'm not crazy year. okay yeah. so I, I guess you know with your newest title coming out through dark and now horse, archie like i just said so Hey, am I, t- I, I, I guess I'm today years old learning that you're doing Archie. Like, is that, uh, what's it's, it doing? It's a one, it's, uh, okay. it's on my mind just that I wrote last week. I'm sorry to keep bringing it up. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 it, it, you it don't have to, to apologize yeah, for the I'm, Archie, I'm like, sir. I'm How like, I have to put this on my calendar is what I'm saying. My, my kids are super Archie fans. It's their favorite thing, my two youngest. Hmm. And so I, I called, I, I was at a con. I saw the editor of Archie and I begged him to let me do an issue just to, so my kids thought I did something interesting for a living. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And they very, very, very okay. kindly said yes. So yes, cool. that's all I, my I'm cousins from New York would issue. give me the Archie double digests, and like when I was younger, I'm like Archie, like what? And he's like, "Yo, get into this yeah. Archie, kid. Like, what are you doing?" I like, had Archie, yeah. What? I had my Archie phase in high school, but but I yeah. brought that question up to say that you know you've you've made your your rounds across the different publishers, but considering that we're here to talk about Helena Winhorn, can you speak how to how Dark Horse stands out from other publishers? Like I've, I've, you know, in other interviews, I've heard that a lot of the comic making process is pretty much the same across different publishers. But is there something that Dark Horse does that just makes them stand out or makes the process a little fun or unique for you? I mean, uh, different levels of support. So I did an image book and that's zero support. So you're not, hmm. you're just, you're basically doing it yourself. Uh, and I, I was lucky on that to be teamed up with Elsa Chartier, who was an incredibly organized person and, and was just carried a lot of that load for, for love everlasting. Uh, and, but I'd never, I would never, it was hard. I, it was, it was legit hard to do on, to do everything by myself. So I, I want now when I do projects to have some sort of editorial support hmm. and uh, I like the editor at Darkstar and it was, and they just, I mean, this is stupid behind the scenes and nobody gives a fuck about, but the deal they offered was just absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah. Term- in, in terms of the possibilities of making it into a TV show um, oh, or making, yeah. it, making it into a movie. Um, so when you, when you're, when you're, even when you're a baby comic creator, which I was not, you know, I created Sheriff of Babylon and, and I gave the rights away. Like uh, they meant nothing to me. I got that beautiful Watchmen deal where if it's out of print ever. And so if DC just says, Oh, it's still in print and I don't get to do the back. <laughs> um, so I never want to kind of do that again and lose control. And dark horse gives me just an absolute ton of control. Uh, it gives Bilkis and I a ton of control over this property so that, so that we, and we're having incredible success with already in Hollywood. So that, 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 that's music. And I'm, I'm with Daniel Shabon, who's a, um, a fantastic editor who edits Bendis um, and edits James uh, mm-hmm. Tynan. And, and so I, you, have, you have a fantastic editor and you get a uh, good media control. That's all. That's perfection for me. Is that like at this point in your career, is that, the most important thing for you now where it's like, all right, I've, I've already written Batman, you know, I've, I've written all these characters that I, I, pro- I can prove my writing prowess. Um, like, are you at a point in your career where you're thinking more so that like longevity, you know, uh, control ownership, like, I guess what, I, I guess what piques your interest in terms of like taking on projects? I mean, that's, I mean, you're asking a good question. I mean, it's mostly like who I get to work with, you know, like, um, you know, I, I, 
at DC, I love my editors. I love uh, uh, Marie, uh, who's head of DC now, is very wonderful. Jim Lee, who's the publishers, is just one of the smartest guys you'll ever meet and solid like a rock. I mean, obviously, he's, he's been the great stars in comics for 30 years. Um, so I just I, I like the people I could work with there and I love the characters. Uh, so, so that that's always part of it. Um, I mean, the other day I was like, Tom, you have to start thinking about your legacy. I was like, I've been in comics for 10 years. What the fuck careers 10 years and you're thinking about your legacy? I was, <laughs> I've only beaten CIA by like two years now. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I, I, I want to do both things. I want to do create your own. Sure, I, I want to do that stuff. And I want to, I don't know, there's something part of me that wants to do the Hollywood stuff. I keep trying to do it. I fail every time. Hmm. I run as fast as I can towards a wall and hit it as hard as I can in Hollywood. Uh you know, I spent two months, I spent two years of my life doing a TV show with Tommy Lee Jones. I wrote a, I, people know I wrote a, Ava DuVernay and I wrote a movie for DC that didn't go anywhere. Um, so, but I, I still have an itch to scratch. I'm from Hollywood. My mother was a studio executive. So I don't know, there's some ed edible thing that I don't know what the fuck it is, but I still want to go out there. <laughs> but, but, but my first love, my only love is comics. Like that's like, I was. I mean, here I was yesterday just sitting around being like, oh, my kids were at their grandparents' house. Like, the house was empty. I was like, I can do anything I want. And I was like, I'm grabbing a Sergeant Rock and going for a read. Damn. You know? Like, Hell yeah. I was, so I was just I sat down and read Sergeant Rock for an hour yesterday. I don't know. That's, I, I love comics. And I grew up on comics. It's always my first medium. And they're the most fun thing to write. So, um, yeah, I, I want to write Wonder Woman until I get to issue 100 and then hopefully do Superman for 100 and... That way, when I have my gravestone, they can be like, Tom King wasted his fucking life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, yeah. So, that I, I, I want to be in both worlds. I, I want I like superheroes, and I also like doing the other stuff. Well, I, I know I, I can speak on, on behalf of a lot of fans. I hope you, you continue to do the comic book thing, and, and that is your passion. Um, and hopefully get to do, like, the Hollywood stuff, because I think, you know, I'm really dumb excited for what – to watch the live adaptation of Supergirl. And I think a lot of your stories would make for some great, you know, live action movies, hell, even like an animated series. So I hope uh, Hollywood wakes up and uh, gets hip to the Tom King train. Um, I want to go ahead and pivot. And if you don't mind, to do some rapid fire questions from our listeners. So I mentioned, you know, we're I'm huge <laughs> fans. Uh, that also extends to our listeners, to the entire short box nation. I had reached out to our Patreon subscribers, told them, Hey, we got Tom King on the show. If you got any burning questions, now is your opportunity, unless you know you can catch him at a um, convention. So I got three questions from listeners, and then I got a voicemail I want to play you, all right? I'm ready. So this first question comes from our, our guy, Mac Jacobs. He writes... What's up, Mac Jacobs? Hell yeah. He writes, hey, Tom, with incredible work such as Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, Danger Street, Human Target, Batman, et cetera, et cetera, do you find it hard to come up with new ideas? And how long does it generally take you before you take your ideas to a publisher? Absolutely love everything you've done. No, I've I've never had trouble coming up with new ideas. Um, I was one of those kids, you know, I was like a fat kid growing up, and you know, they'd always be like, "Well, you 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 come in last and everything, but you got a really good imagination." <laughs> they would, you know, they'd be like, you know, you, and I'd be like, "Oh, fuck! What a use is that? A good imagination? I want to win the goddamn <laughs> race. <laughs> I want to be the best goddamn tetherball player in the." The yard and it's got a good imagination you know tetherball uh, but but who the fuck knew they were right that hmm. um I, I i i i've never had trouble come up with stories i i i i go for a walk i watch a lot of old movies i steal from old hmm. movies constantly um I, I i put on some music i go for a walk i imagine the characters and soon they're doing things and i'm and i'm following the story it's it's really no different than being nine years old and you pour all your gi joes out in the middle of the floor and you say okay what are we doing today guys you know what's fun i'm i still do that for a living so uh there's there's a famous comic strip um oh god who fucking wrote it Arch, archie goodwin wrote it mm. and and drew it um the late archie goodwin and and, and and someone's like where does your where do your ideas come from and he drew a comic strip and it's just he's like here's the secret of comics and he shows him you know typing at his typewriter and then he stops and he puts one hand on his fist and, and looks out into the air and he's like and sometimes it's a two-fister and two, that sounds wrong but uh but yeah it's it's, it's all just about it's, it all, it's all just about staring into space and and and, and imagining it yeah and uh someday i'll be like fuck i'm blocked i have no more things uh, but not today 
Really quick, to, to go to that old movies uh, uh, comment you made, do you have like a particular director that you gravitate towards in terms of like watching their movie? Do you have a favorite director, I guess? That's a good question. No, I don't really have a favorite director. I like to watch a lot of noirs. It's kind of where I'm wearing a fucking Laura shirt. You see, I'm like, uh, so, so I, I, I watch constantly watch noirs and old. If you want, if you want to be a good writer, go back into the 40s and 50s and watch westerns and see how simple the plots are. Hmm. You know, obviously, uh, Supergirl owes a lot to True Grit, which is not an old movie, but it's it's awful old mess. And then, like, Up in the Sky owes a lot to The Searchers. The Searchers, um, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, but but I, I watch I watch a lot of old noirs, which are sort of a bizarre genre of the, of the 40s and 50s where someone does a crime and they eventually get caught by the crime because the way the the way the censorship code, nobody could do a crime without getting caught. Um so there's kind of this horrible fate to everyone where they kind of have a fate constantly. And I'm, I'm, I'm utterly obsessed with the genre. This is uh, the Haysburg code? Uh, yeah, the Hays code, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hays code. Hays code. Exactly. All right. See, do you we, wanna... we, had that, we had that in comics, too. If you, if you did a, a crime in 50s and 60s comics, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't get away with it. You, it had right. to be resolved. Uh, see, do you want to go ahead and toss up this next one? Yeah, this is, this is coming from our boy Chris Jenks. Uh, What's up, Chris? He asks... What was the inspiration behind one of the most influential books, Mr. Miracle, one of my favorites, of all time? That's what he said. Parentheses uh, and everything. Uh, it's a great question. I, the, I, 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 what happened was Dan Didio and I went out. Uh, Mitch and I had just been, had been working on a book that had been taken from us. It was the, was the War of Jokes and Riddles. Basically, they decided that was going to be in the main Batman series, and Mitch wasn't good enough to draw it, which seems absurd to us in retrospect. Mm. Um, and, but because they took that away, they wanted to give us something just so we had work. And so Dan DiDio and I went out and he offered me Mr. Miracle. And that day I went home and I was, it sounds where well, I was in, I was in Baltimore. Um, and I took it, I was, took a shower. So I gave you that horrible image, but, and I was, I was just thinking like, what can't Mr. Miracle escape? And I was like, he can't escape death. And, um, what does that mean? If you can't escape death, like, he probably wants to escape it. Well, how do you, how do you, what do you do if you want to escape death? You kill yourself. And I was like, oh shit, he kills himself. And then he survives and wakes up, but doesn't know where he is. And that's, that's, it just started with just very simple thoughts like that and, yeah. and went from there. And the, the inspiration was, I mean, I told you about that. I, I'd had this sort of breakdown, woken up into this shitty world, not to repeat myself. And I wanted to write about what it's like to be a new father and, and, and to think it, it you have moments where you're like, is this real? Is this my life? Is this, is everything going terribly? Or is everything going poorly? I wanted to sort of write about that feeling and use all of that curviness as a metaphor for what that was. And that's what we did. You have those thoughts in the shower and I'm in the shower. Like we're running out of eggs. I should probably go get some eggs tomorrow. Damn. This is why there's no eggs in my fucking house. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. All right. uh, We got one more question from our listeners. And uh, this one comes from our friend, Henry Hernandez. And he took the prompt very seriously. I think he maybe thought that uh, this was the only opportunity because he sent in a flurry of questions. So I'll let you pick which one you want. Uh, but a I'm lot ready. of gr- great questions here, Henry. I so he wants it. to know. He wants to know. What do you consider to be your greatest achievement so far, and why? What have you done to improve your skills over like the past? In, like in life or like in comics? Mm. I think I, I think it's safe to say probably in the context of comics. In, in the context of comics, yeah. my my greatest achievement. Uh, I made Elmer Fudd cool for a small moment. Yo, that co-signed seems, that. That could be it, right? That's got to be the uh, that's thanks, to, issue. thanks to Lee Weeks, though. Lee Weeks did the, the he most did of bring that, it. But... He brought the A game. That's a good one. All right, that's, that's got to be that's got to be the height. All right, what have you done to improve your skills over the past year as a comic book writer? Jam, that's a fucking great question. Every day, I. When I go to sleep at night every day, I'm like, what did I do wrong today as a comic book writer? I like I have that <laughs> angst at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> what did I do to improve my I, I watched a lot of movies. I read a ton of books. I mean, I tried to absorb shit. I tried to get out of my comfort zone and read sort of comics I hadn't read before. <laughs> old strips I haven't read before. Trying to find sort of a new zone to, to get in. Um, I worked a lot on changing my style. You know, I'm trying to get out of repeating myself. I really fucking am. Um, so yeah, I, maybe that's probably the, the thing I most did. I, I tried to change my style of writing hmm. to, to get a more to get a more clean line into it. All right, and then last question, and he writes, and finally, 
why did you kill Alfred during your Batman run? <laughs> I, just, I just I don't like British people. I don't know what they. Well, <laughs> yeah, fuck. Them. We're Americans, right? We we fucking yeah, overthrew right. the British. That's what, that's the yeah. whole point of our country. Uh, yeah, I, Henry does. Alfred, you see that? Fake, famous M. You guys probably heard Alfred was not supposed to die. He was. Hmm. It was supposed to be a fake out. It was supposed to be um, a fear gas, and Damien was seeing his worst fear, which was Alfred dying. And after the issue came out, it was so popular and people liked it so much that Dio called me and said, Alfred's dead. Um, oh, wow. Which which was news to me at the time. And that's why he has such a shitty death. He just kind of, he doesn't sacrifice. He doesn't, he, so eventually I went on a, I went on a walk with my editor. I went on a, I was walking my dog. I called my editor on the phone. I was like, we can't kill Alfred this way because there's no, he doesn't sacrifice himself. He doesn't save anybody. Alfred can't go out like that. Um and we came up with a way to sort of retroactively make it so that him being in that room hmm. was him saving Batman. And once we'd done that, we knew Alfred was dead. Um, I, I did not expect him to stay dead for fucking five years. That's news to me. I hate, huh. but I have to say, as a writer, it's shitty because I love writing Alfred and Batman. It's just like he's, we were talking about with Chris Claremont. Alfred hmm. is Batman's brain. Alfred is Batman's kind of sarcastic doubting brain to everything he does and gordon's like the other side like his grumpy grandpa like it's just like spock and hmm. and um and bones that's and bones. Alfred gordon damn and, i'm really glad you cleared that up. i did not know that story at all yeah, uh, that's that's and, that's that's how it went down who knew and if there's one person that doesn't need any more heat on them is dan didio so thank you for sharing that story all right i've got Dan's one cool. i've got one last heat. question for you and uh, this one comes from someone special. Uh, you know, here on the show, you know, we fully understand that the, the fans and the readers, as well as the retailers, are the lifeblood of comics. So we reached out to our favorite comic retailer, who's also sponsored this show, uh, Ben Kingsbury from Gotham City Limit. He went ahead awesome. and we gave him the special, we gave him the VIP treatment and let him submit a voicemail. So I want to play that for you. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate everything you do. Hey, Tom, voicemail Ben K from Gotham City Limit, Jacksonville, Florida here. We consider Wonder Woman and the Penguin both must-read DC comics right now at our shop, and that's where our question stems from. Would you rather pen an epic about a hero's journey or delve into the psyche of a captivating villain? I'll leave you to answer. Thanks so much for taking our question. And remember, Shortbox Nation, always take it to the limit. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's awesome. Hell yeah, man. Um... You know, just to be perfectly honest, don't tell anybody this. I'd rather kind of go into the villain for Sasquatch. No, I agree. Uh, I love writing Wonder Woman. It is, it's super fun, but it's hard. It's a hard book to write. It's because mm. e every book has to be. I mean, there's just a, there's there's a high bar to clear, it. and and the whole point of Wonder Woman is how awesome Wonder Woman is, and it's to show that off over. And, and 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 I like that. I like how she shines. I like that, and I love the backups. It's my favorite thing. But just if I was like just to sit down and write something, I like dirty, grimy stuff. I like street level stuff. I like crimes. I like people bleeding. I like bad guys winning. That that stuff is. I, I just I, I that, that that's what I like to watch, and that's what I, I like. You know, I like Sopranos. Hmm. Um, I like The Boys more than I like say watching you know like a Justice League or something. I, <laughs> I, I, that's Got it. You're I, I, more I, I of a like, Deep Space Nine guy. We got it. We got I it. I fucking am. I am a DS9 guy for sure. That's my, hmm. yeah, that's, that's my favorite Star Trek. So, yeah, I, I, I like the dark side of things. But Wonder Woman's pretty much a joy. I got to write Wonder Woman next week. Tom. You, I was going to say, okay, okay. no, I was going to make a joke. You, you, you cut, you, you segued into Ben's segment so good that I couldn't tell my joke when you're like, do we have any other questions? And I was going to be like, yeah, what does. God need with a starship. <laughs> oh my God! One of the best line ever. Star Trek Five. Star Trek Five. Not a great movie, but goddamn, it's a great line. Okay. That's a Star Trek line. Five is not a great movie, but I would argue it's great as far as you get that Bone Spock hmm. dynamic with Kirk. Just oh. them pure mm, chef's kiss. Good. He's like, you know, Jim, you really pissed me off today. You know, like just them having his. I'm attempting to toast a marshmallow. You know, like all that stuff is just. Mm, delicious no it's it's it, it has it it's like moment to moment there's some beautiful and it's like the first time that mccoy gets like his own scene with his father and the whole thing there's some oh awesome my gosh stuff. oh there's my some gosh. awesome stuff in that movie and you get the fan dance you know like everyone gets a moment <laughs> but 
uh, but just as the movie as a whole, it's not great. But it's worth it. It's just worth it for why does God need a starship? That's oh, it's beautiful. An utterly. I wrote a I wrote a Green Lantern comp of me and Doc Shaner, which was all about. And when I write mm-hmm. Hal Jordan, I just I write him as uh, as as Shatner's Kirk. That's beautiful. And <laughs> that's so funny because it's no fear, right? It's no fear. That's 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 what Hal is about. And that's what that's what. That's oh, what uh, God uh, damn it. About. Now, that's all I'm ever going to see. Now that's, that's the voice it, of Green that's Lantern the in the Justice League. When it's not John Stewart, it's going to be like, it's like, we got to call so Hal. Weird. Where's he at? But he's the guy who looks God in the face <laughs> and says, why do you need a starship? So I wrote this whole thing where, like, you know, they're all asking it's a great issue. each Green Lantern to, are, do you want to be God? And all they're going, no, I don't want to be God. You know, we're not supposed to be God. And Hal's like, yeah, I'll be God. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Of Show course. me what you got. Show me why what you got. Why wouldn't I be God? So I've got a ring. Yeah. No. Tom, well, I, I would like right. to think that we have touched on a little bit of, of a little bit of everything. Obviously, we if did. we were to we covered a ton. touch, uh, you know, deep dive everything, we'd be here for a six part, eight part show. Yeah. So I, I, I've got one more question for you, but I want to insert this one here and ask, is there something like a, a topic or a question that you feel you don't get a chance to talk about or, or, or answer or kind of like, you know, reference? Like, what's a question that you wish more people would ask you about in terms of like your career and comics and when you get on other podcasts you ever feel like damn i wish they would have asked me about that i really want to talk about that tom do you need a nap are you okay <laughs> <laughs> damn how can i forget tom how are you tom buddy are you okay the person it's hard it's hard it's hard to take that who is tom king <laughs> i'm awesome. okay i'm okay i'm okay yeah. i'll be fine virtual hug virtual hug there's no question anybody ever asked me i mean I, I i like talking comics i like talking movies i like it all no, it's, it's fine everything's well, good well i guess with that in mind what's one piece of advice that you'd give to an aspiring comic creator that's listening right now that wants to be the next tom king maybe it's something that you wish you would have known uh, when you first started that maybe would have made your life a whole lot easier. Do you have any piece of advice to share? And don't say comics will break your heart, kid. Okay, don't. Just don't. <laughs> comics <laughs> have not broken name. my heart. I'm Thank sure ten, 10 years from now you'll have me on and I'll give you the whole spiel of how it all fuck, fuck me over. But for Tom, now, we I'm... won't have to wait 10 years, okay? Let's not do that. <laughs> yeah, see you next week. All right, yeah, next, next week, week. I'll send you the invite come link. Yeah. Come on, come on. We'll talk about your dinner. Uh, I have my dream job, guys. I do it every mm-hmm. single day. It's cool. A, 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 it's it. I have no complaints about comics. Um, uh, this is very practical, boring advice, and I apologize for it, but maybe uh, whenever you ask me how to, how to write, Alan Moore wrote a comic book on how to write comics. It's hmm. like $7 on Amazon, uh, and he wrote it right after he wrote Watchmen, so it's like Alan Moore at the height of his powers as a as writer. And Alan Moore's <laughs> obviously, he's like the goat. So like, I-, I could give you lots of advice, or I could just tell you, go buy the goat's book on how to write comics, because that's <laughs> what I did. And I learned about character and about structure and about everything. And it's just like, it'll take you 30 minutes to read it. And so so just go on Amazon and be like, Alan Moore, how to write comics, and buy that fucking thing and read through it. I hope right, you know, very, very practical advice for the wannabe comic writer. It's it's exactly what I did, and it fucking worked. All right. You know what? Fuck it. I wasn't going to ask this question, but I'm asking it. If you had a Mount Rushmore of comic book writers, it sounds like Alan Moore is a gimme. He's on there. Who else is on that Mount Rushmore? Shit, I've thought about this. This is a tough one, man. This is tough. Um, are we just, wait, first? I need some clarifications. Are we just doing comic books, not comic mm. strips? Oh, or are we doing? No, throw the strips doing, in there. Throw the yeah, strips doing, in there. We're doing strips too. Unless, okay. unless you can make a completely separate. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right, all right. I value them as well. I do. I know it. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I do value them. Because for Aaron me, the Cruz. first the first three comes super fast because okay. it's 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 Frank Miller and Alan Moore. I just think they are the two mm. touchstones of my generation that the, the, the sort of 1986 moment in comics will never be equal with D- DKR and Watchmen coming out. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be friends with Frank and he's he's an <laughs> awesome dude. He's been super supportive of me and my career. And I I love the dude. Cool. Um, I, Alan Moore probably hates me for the Rorschach stuff, but he's still cool. I still love him. I worship <laughs> his stuff. Yeah, uh, and then I I I, I got to throw Stan Stan Lee on there. I you go back and read those Stanley. I know he's got a bad rep because of like all the publicity stuff he did, but those original Stanley comics when he sort of brings soap opera into the comics and and makes it what it is. I I think they're still unrivaled, and 
his his record of what he co-created with spider-man and fantastic four i mean it'll, it'll just it'll never be equal to what he brought hmm. to comics um so i start with those three then it gets a little harder but if we're putting strips in it gets a little easier because i can throw charles schultz on there um charles schultz i think in terms of comics like i'm talking from like ancient cairo to today in terms of pictures going with words i think charles schultz is the top of the mountain i think hmm. peanuts is is the, the best thing that, that that ever came out of comics um, and, and maybe ever will come out of comics. And it, and it's so bizarre because he was a super weird Midwestern kind of semi-religious guy. And somehow he managed to mine his bizarreness through a child's comic that also appealed to every single person in the country. I, it's it's bizarre what, how he did that. Um, which leaves me one more slot. And I'm fucked because I don't know who should, I, who should I put on this last slot. Uh, should I put like my boy Walter Simonson on there just because he brought me mm, into it? Sure. I'm going to put Walt on there just because I love him. Just because for the love. There you go. Just because there's no one better in comics than Walt Simonson. And he should be on the list. Damn. Mount Rushmore's only got four heads, but we're taking the fifth. No. Oh, we like, oh, the, the fifth head. Oh, <laughs> no, well, you know, I've... I've no, we I forgot uh, about the fourth head. Look, look, look. The first off, head. just like Zod. I said I five fingers. What do you mean? <laughs> Zod. Z- Zod was able to laser his face yes. on the uh, Mount yes. Rushmore Superman too. Tom King can do as you he know wishes. Said, I've been to, I've been to Mount Rushmore because my family is from Northern Nebraska, so I've actually been out to. The, so I'm the worst because I've actually seen the fucking thing. No, look, I, I have to remind myself every time I ask that question. Oh, there's only four. But you know what? It's to say as I was point, right, I think well, that's my four are easy. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to refine the question too. If you had to pick your uh, Zod Mount Rushmore, <laughs> who's on it? I love dude, it. I was, uh, dude. I was. Can we do artists? Like... Can we do art? Can we do artists now? Or yes, we do the, yes, the other direction. That's hard too, right? Um, I was. Gonna... I go... go ahead. Well, I was going to say what, what, what you can yours? put as what many. Yours? You can put as many as you oh, want. God, well, he threw it back to us. Oh shit! Well, Bill Waterson's going to go up there. Bill Watterson's fucking genius guy. He's going up there for sure. He's still alive. He is still alive. He is fucking. Bill Watterson is right now in yeah. Ohio, just like fucking he's watching the, the Daily he, Show. He's, he's the big foot of comics. Yeah, for sure. He's definitely doing that. Yeah. Bill Watterson, he's Bernie Wrightson. Um, oh, man. You've got Jeez. artists of writer. Oh, you're doing arts now. You're just yeah, doing art. Yeah. Okay. Bur- yeah, Good um, God. I feel like I always have this list and then I forget it every time. Okay. I'm just going to write what comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, this is making. Is it riveting? Podcast? No, no, no. Yeah, Rick. Uh, no, I want to say Rick Beach. Okay. Wow, really? He's Rick on your Beach, Mount Rushmore. You got no, two no. Swamp Thing guys on there. I see where you're going. Where you, where you're sure. I mean, you know, I, I'm a, I'm an easy mark for the horror stuff. No, I get. Uh, horror is fucking man, hard. I just did that book with Mitch. It's hard to write horror. I'm impressed. I want to say Mike Kaluta. I want to say another Mike guy who did Swamp Thing covers. I feel like. But, uh, but also horror covers in the seventies. His shadow like, stuff was, is is unparalleled. He is the the king of covers, man. Those those seventies yeah. covers. He did. Damn, Gary I Gianni, uh, Mark Schultz. God, there's so many. I don't know. I can't. My head's exploding. Fuck it. God, Cadillacs Mark Schultz, and dinosaurs. That's, that's, top of the head. The other I'm way. I can hate myself tomorrow. Uh, love no, I just read no, that over Christmas break. God, I love that book. Hmm. All right, no particular order. Top of the head. I hate myself in the morning. Uh, Andy Kubert, Jim Lee, Mark Bagley, Mobius. And Frank Miller. Oh, look at you with your little pinkies out with the Mobius, dude. <laughs> that is yes. a wonderful list. And I've, I I work with Frank Miller just very briefly on one page. And I've worked with Jim Lee very briefly on one page. Uh, but I did a... <laughs> I did a whole book. I did a whole book with Frank Miller, so there was that. So, yeah, do well, you have any? I'm sorry. Do you have any? Oh, good... no, no, Frank, with Andy Kuber. Oh my god, my my brain slipped. I did a whole book with Andy Kuber called Up in the Sky, and he was a joy to work with, and is the nicest fucking Damn, guy in the world. I forgot. Tom, you've got so much in your catalog. I forgot all about how good Up in the Sky is. Like, that is... We were talking about... Uh, we had Christopher Priest on the show uh, two episodes ago. And legend, so we were talking about... Super, Christopher Priest. Yeah, oh, yeah dude, man. The combo was amazing. It was fun. And um, we were joking that, you know, we, he was on to talk about Vampirella, but his Superman Lost series had just wrapped up. And he found... Like, he obviously really loves what he did it, it holds a high place for him and it was really awesome to hear right. what he was talking about but man he found a way to insert superman in every single question even if it was about like vampirella um but yeah i i forgot that you also have a killer superman run yeah you, your catalog is crazy but the question i wanted to ask is do you have any good jim lee stories because i understand jim lee was the reason that omega man omega men came back from like cancellation right like he went ahead and kind of pulled some strings 
I do, but my favorite Jim Lee story is so we yeah. went to went to Toronto and there's I'm I'm sorry for Canada fans. There's a huge building in Toronto that's like their Empire State Building. It's like the new the needle or something. And you can go to the top of it, like as a tourist, and what they do is they hook you up to like a rope and you walk to the edge of the building and you lean over the side of it and look oh, down okay. on the whole city, like you're at the top of the Empire State Building. And um me, Scott Snyder, Jim Lee, and Dan DiDio decided, why not? What are we going to do tonight? <laughs> not do this? Um, and we went to the top of this building, and uh, Dan got out was like, no, fuck no, I'm not going. That's <laughs> <laughs> sane, man. Good to know. S- S- Scott and I kind of slowly walked, and you're just, every instinct in you is being like, no, don't do this. Like, your feet are like go fuck yourself. I'm not going any farther. And you're just like, we're, we're tied to a rope. We can't die. And your brain is like, no, we're going to die. That's too far. And you go and you look off the edge and you're just like, oh my God. And, and Scott and I are freaked out of our minds. And we're like, we're like, we're brothers forever. We did this together. We're courage. We're cur-. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and we look over and Jim is next to us. And Jim is all the way leaning off the edge. So just the ropes hold him looking down at the abyss of life. And I swear to fucking God, he looked bored. He's like, that's it. Damn. That's all you got. That's all you got? Gangsta. Like, that was, gangsta, that was dude. Jim Lee. That was Jim Lee. He's just like, what's the next thing? What's the next mountain I can climb after this? That was, he's like, can I jump off? Can I cut the line? Can I, like, Yo, that's, yeah, that's who he is, man. Jim Lee was like, I survived Rob Lee Hill, all right? Nothing can scare me. You too. <laughs> Damn. All right. Tom, oh, I feel like we have given you ample time to think of your answer to the, uh, to the last uh, pivotal question of the show which is who is your mount rushmore of comic book artists you still gotta get it you still gotta oh, give us shit. yours now i gotta do them again oh yeah, my I gotcha god now um alex toth nice uh, Come on. frank frank miller again he's the only guy he appears on both that's why frank is a genius yeah um joe kubert i love joe kubert stuff <laughs> i can't I, I can't get out of it and i'll put one modern guy just so i don't sound like or, but uh, uh darwin cook i darwin cook oh, to me was shit. just so fucking transcendent. I've got three of his pages up on my wall. I just Damn. think Darwin. That was a guy I would have, you know, I, I I was on a panel with him when in the very beginning of my career, and he was like six seats over. I was like, when this panel ends, I'm running over to say hi to him. And a, a very kind fan got a signature from me. And by the time I looked back, he was gone, and then I never saw him again. So wow, uh, I, I regret that I never got to meet him. But I, I yeah. worship Darwin's art. I think it's brilliant. Awesome. It's brilliant. Damn. Tom, this has been fantastic uh, and a, a lot of fun too. Yeah, man, thanks, a lot of man. Fun. I'm I'm going to be thinking of you next time on I'm on the shitter. Oh, the comic book. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that uh, image. I have do a legacy. Have... I have a legacy. <laughs> Three shitter, baby. Uh, Tom, do you have anything that you want to say in, in, in parting? Uh, do you have uh, shameless plugs? Anything you want to say about Helena Windhorn before we sign off, or just anything in general? We we toss it to you. I'm going to reiterate what I said at the beginning, which is just thank you to everybody listening. Thank you to the store owners who are out there. Uh, uh, like I said, I started with Vision, a book that was super weird. I moved on to Mr. Miracle that was super weird. I write super weird shit and only people only buy it because someone at the comic book mm-hmm. store is like, have you tried this? And people are like, no, I don't want to try that. That looks weird. And they're like, you got to try it. Like my whole career was made out of that conversation. Hmm. And so I just want to say thank you to all the people listening who had that conversation. I appreciate it. Man, facts, because that's how I got into your work with Image, was the the lo- uh, Amber, local comic shop girl, was like, you need to read this weird shit. I was like, sign me up. All Thank right. you, Amber. I yeah, appreciate dude. it. Well, I guess with that being said, I'll, I'm going to let the listen- listeners know. I'm going to have links to your socials, to, to the website, and the show notes. And, of course, yo, look, Helena Winhorn issue one is out the same day that you're hearing this. It's in your local comic shops. It's a fantastic book. Like I said, it means he had an opportunity to read uh, an advanced preview. I'm, I'm going to go pick up a copy today. So you do so as well. And let us know what you thought of this episode. And, uh, Tom, once again, you've been great, and we welcome you back uh, anytime yeah, you want, man. We'd love to pick your brain some more. Yeah, man. You're so kind, guys, man. I really appreciate you.